our last speaker for the morning, Dr. Andrew Hyder, who is the clinical director of Iris Care Group. Now, Dr. Hyder is a consultant clinical and forensic psychologist who dedicated most of his career to working with people with severe and complex mental health problems, including offending behavior, and he's worked in secure inpatient settings and the community. So, Dr. Hyder, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. So I'll try and keep it as brief as possible because I'm aware that probably everybody's stomach is crying out in, uh, in suffering. Um, and just to start, our, our previous speaker mentioned their um, anxiety over PowerPoint. And um, I've come up from Cardiff this morning and uh, one of the things that happened when I was on the train was that one of our trainees has done this uh, CPD talk. We have internal CPD events and did this CPD talk on patient safety. It's a new paper that's come out on patient safety and mental health, which is really good. So I'd asked them to put this talk together. And I was flicking through this PowerPoint, you know, on my way here. And, uh, you know, my own inadequacy kind of started to build, you know, as I, as I was watching it. So I'm not promising any uh, fancy animations or anything, but hopefully what I say will, um, will connect with with what other people have said. And I guess my first reflection um, is, is really the, the, the degree of commonality, really, between what I'm about to say and um, some of the speakers I've, I've previously heard today. And, and I must admit, it, it does sadden me, um, having worked in the system for, for around about 26 years um, with this client group, um, it saddens me that we, we, we do have these conversations. So. So just to introduce myself, my name's Andrew. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I work as clinical director for Iris Care Group. So we're a new organisation that was formed by the merger last year of an organisation called Ludlow Street Healthcare um, and Homely Care. Um, Homely Care is a supported living provider in the southwest of England, and Ludlow Street Healthcare is a very large social care and healthcare organisation based in, in South Wales. So we've got about 1,500 staff in total, and we field the whole range um, of clinical disciplines. I've been I've been working in, in current job for for ten years. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is a, is an evaluation and just some initial data really um, on an evaluation we've done um, on um, the um, destination data of a cohort of people. Um, who've ended up being referred to our community residential care services. Um, so I was particularly interested in looking at that. So we've done a 10-year study of all of the people who've been in our services and been discharged because I wanted to see what the evidence was. One, in terms of, you know, were we supporting people to, to move on to a better life? Um, and two, um, you know, what was the relationship between the treatment and care that people had had before they came to us and where they ended up. Because I'm, I make no kind of apologies about this. I'm extremely um, skeptical about the effectiveness of the current mental health system. And I kind of wanted to just explore that a bit more. Um, and just as a, as a note, if anybody's interested, if you do have a large data set now, it's a lot easier to get this data out because there's a new tool called Code um, Interpreter, which you can use on GPT-4, the AI. So. Um, I have used, um, obviously, redacted data. It's just, just numbers, but I've used that to kind of support the analysis. So any organisation that does have large data sets that you need to analyse, you can now use GPT-4. It's pretty good. Um, you do have to supervise it quite a lot, um, but, but you do get useful results from it in a lot less time. So I'll be talking about the outline of the evaluation, um, then a discussion of um, the admission and destination data, and we will be thinking about cost as well, because um, I think it was Emma who mentioned earlier about the, the, the kind of constant struggles we get around the cost and sort of thinking about how, how we resource and run this system that we try and help people through. Um, then a thematic overview of the kind of... So we didn't just do the numbers, we did a thematic overview. What was the kind of... Um, presentation and kind of clinical issues that predicted you know, a kind of good outcome for the person when they moved on from our services. Because obviously we don't want people to stay in residential social care forever. We want people to move uh, to their own accommodation or, or to a lower tier, um, lower tier provision, usually supported living. 
Um, then we're going to be thinking a bit about clinical process and how we actually do the work. So the, the, the actual primary task, which we can kind of get, often forget when we talk about commissioning, frameworks, policies, guidelines. You know, what is the primary task of the organisation providing support for people? What do the staff actually do? So not kind of just thinking about alphabeti spaghetti psychological models, but what do they actually do? Um, and then some thoughts, really, and recommendations about, you know, what the data sort of indicates regarding um, commissioning and cost. And I'll try and get that done as quickly as I can to get you to your lunch quickly. Um, so we looked at all of our discharged residential social care placements over a 10-year period from our Ocean Community Services service. Um, the total end was 67. We did use diagnostic categorization, although I, I know there are huge problems with that. We, we, we kind of filtered people in terms of, was there any psychosis at all? Was there any personality disorder um, diagnosis? And I put that in parentheses and in inverted commas because of the kind of controversies around that, that label. Um, and were there um, any other um, sort of no psychosis groups or other, other difficulties that people had that didn't fall into those, those categories? And we did an exploratory statistical analysis of that data looking at these questions. So level of service means, you know, did they go to secure service, secondary care, supported living, own accommodation? Um, so we found that the level of security the person had been in prior to their admission had absolutely no relationship at all with the discharge destination, and I tortured the data, right? So I was <laughs> thinking, is there anything here? There's no relationship at all. Um, and the, the positive thing for us in terms of kind of feedback on, on the service we provide was that supported living was the most frequent discharge destination. We also found that people with personality disorder diagnosis had a shorter length of stay and were significantly more likely than people with a different non-psychosis diagnosis or a psychosis diagnosis to be discharged to their own accommodation. So there's this sort of imbalance here between what people say about the kind of challenges of that cohort of people with a diagnosis of personality disorder present to services and, you know, what, what these outcomes suggest. Because many people would probably say, um, and I, I don't know what all of you guys do, but a lot of you would probably say that in terms of service demand and outcomes, that might not be the case for, for your data. Um, there was a small but still sizable cohort who returned to inpatient secondary care. Um, and of that cohort, it was those people with that diagnosis who were more likely than people with a different non-psychotic diagnosis to return to secondary care. Um, nobody was discharged to secure services, but we couldn't track the eventual destinations from secondary care um, after people left us, because they, and they may, have, they may have ended up being readmitted to... Um, to uh, secondary care services. So here are the results, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share this data if anybody wants to get in touch with me after the, 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 the conference and, 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 and share it with you, because it might take me a while. But the general thrust of it here is, is you, I don't know whether you can see this, and I was a bit worried about the size of the screen. Um, but you, you look at where people came from. Um, most people did come to us from secondary care, and the typical type of person we get from secondary care is somebody who'd been in a PQ perhaps or a lock rehab or some kind of acute ward for a long time, lots of concerns about risk and safety and were felt that they needed a residential setting. Similarly, a lot of people come from the sort of lock rehabilitation tier and I know that a lot of you will be aware of the, the discussions in commissioning around the, the status and the effectiveness of that tier. And you can see on the bottom left the flow um, from the diagnosis category, uh, category to discharge um, destination showing that supported living was the was the the kind of main um, the main discharge destination. Okay, so what we found was that we did get positive outcomes for a small, high demand, previously inpatient population, but the service costs, you know, they're high costs. So we provide um, the whole MDT around the person. Um, so psychiatry, we use high-grade clinical and forensic psychologists more than we do the kind of less experienced people because of the nature of the people we work with. Um, we develop bespoke um, social care support worker roles where we train people to undertake particular evidence-based psychological tasks with high levels of supervision. 
So we have high levels of staff supervision and support demand, um, high governance demand in terms of risk governance and legal, um, lots of involvement in, in relation to Mental Health Act, uh, part three cases, court of protection, etc. And uh, like our colleagues from LifeWays earlier, very high um, levels of statutory liaison. Um, so, you know, we are, it is, you know, less costly financially to uh, provide a service uh, to people in this kind of way uh, as opposed to inpatient costs. But I think from a commissioning point of view, one of the challenges is, is that, you know, you can't kind of do this work in an inexpensive way well with people with this level of difficulty. <coughs> Um, so a thematic overview, really, around you know what um, what we found in terms of the people who seem to kind of move on to supported living or to their own accommodation, um, and this is kind of what we try and do to support people generally. So we found this sort of degree of pre-existing coping affected people's placement stability. Lots of people come to us from hospital settings um, who um, present as essentially untreated. Um, there's an issue there because a lot of hospitals will say they do various different treatments, but that perhaps doesn't happen. Or if it does happen, perhaps there's some challenge in, in delivering that to people when they're in a hospital setting. Um, people who, and we use metrics, by the way, to we, uh, use a lot of patient reported experience measures for all the people we, look, we, we support. Um, so people who perceive themselves as safer and were able to construct and work towards more functional goals were at reduced risk of recall and admission. So we try and get beyond this problem in the system where, um, as a system, we're kind of very focused on technology in terms of medication, psychotherapies. All of those things are really important, but they don't necessarily, I think, determine somebody's degree of hope um, that they can have a narrative for themselves, a story for themselves that, that takes them. Um, and this is the next point. So they're developing an identity other than that of a patient. Um, but while you do that, to support people with that, it's also really important that you know, the people who did better trusted that support wouldn't be withdrawn. So one of the challenges, for example, that I've had as a responsible clinician is moving people on from Section 17 ACTOs or discharging them from that when they associate the statutory framework with safety. Uh, uh, so you know, the ability to be detained is associated with safety. And that's independent of their diagnosis or their symptoms. Um, MDT-driven care and support from experienced clinicians who can tolerate risk. Um, in my work as a clinician, I do quite a lot of clinical work. Um, I'm frequently in touch with NHS services, police, Ministry of Justice, being very clear for people who are on part three if there's been an escalation, you know, re requesting that the recall doesn't happen on the basis of mitigations we've put in place and on our basis of the knowledge of the patient and how we've stabilised the situation. But that does take quite a lot of clinical courage. And I think where the system doesn't back people up who have clinical courage and kind of the risk is something goes wrong, obviously, and then people can get blamed, you know, it's very, very hard then to function with this kind of cohort of people as a clinician. Um, but what we found was that sort of more experienced clinicians do better supporting people for longer term without readmission. For people with psychosis, this, the presence of threat control override symptoms was associated with service decisions to recall and readmit nearly always. So these are people with, from a forensic population who are feeling both threatened and struggling to manage their response to threat. So if anybody wants to talk to me in more detail about this, I'm happy to. Um, so just a little bit about what we do now. How much time have I got left? Three minutes. <laughs> um, so we use a system we call RISE. Um, it's essentially a um, relationally and socially focused model of care um, aimed at a cohort of people with very severe and complex and long-term problems. Um, the, the, the foundation of it is that we support non-clinical staff to use basic evidence-based approaches to preventive and reactive care that's specifically tailored to mental health problems. So we kind of pick and, pick and choose the best bits from the evidence base um, around working with people with really complex needs. Co-produced support planning, we get service users to lead their MDT <coughs> meetings wherever possible, and discipline naive clinical leadership. And I, this is a point I think is really important here, 
is that you know, we focus on the experience in clinical case management rather than the discipline. One of the problems I think in the system we've got now is there's still a lot of guild interests that, that direct the, the way the system works. So we try and move beyond that while clearly working within statutory frameworks, particularly around um, responsible clinicians and approved clinicians. Um, I'm just going to skip over this. This is just a, a bit of a clip of um, the kind of way that we support staff to understand what to do. So going back to this point earlier, we very much focus on what we want people to do. So um, just a conclusion. Um, um, despite many years of evidence, we continue to treat people in hospital for too long. I think I missed a talk earlier where somebody was referencing that that had been said. You know, I agree. <laughs> Um, but commissioning frameworks for community placements need to be aligned to the clinical need for this cohort. Um, many of the years being sort of routinely risk managed via these long-term hospital stays, and that becomes a variable in how they present. So that you kind of can't take that away. So they are going to need more support. You can't just say, well, actually, we, the framework we were thinking about supporting you was, was the wrong one, so here's a new one. You know, it's not going to work like that. Um, the other thing is, is that despite the claims of the adherence for sort of brand name psychological treatments and pharmacological, pharmaceutical companies, the evidence base for, for the specific treatments um, for complex mental health problems is not great quality. There's some reasonable evidence, but the overall evidence base is not great. And it does not allow for firm conclusions to be drawn about what works in this cohort. You have to take a very ideographic and individualized approach. But we do know that generally experiencing supportive and adequate relationships in a social context where we feel known and understood by other people is good for all of us. So what we should be doing is thinking about developing systems that translate that into our general treatment and support principles while maintaining clinical oversight. Because you know, we cannot just sort of take that away. People do need that clinical oversight, not least often because there's a statutory framework around their care. So we've just shown that this relatively small data sample of what I would call an ultra-high complexity cohort indicates that the previous hospital level of security does not reduce the likelihood of a good outcome or improve it. So it doesn't seem to have any effect at all. And that's very small n. It was relatively well-powered, though, if anybody wants to see the data. Um, but what we do know is that people with a diagnosis of personality disorder after a period of community intervention using this framework were more likely to move to lower tier supported living or to move to their own, own accommodation. So there's a little, little slide on what we do and who we are, but I, everybody wants their lunch more than they want me to say who we do and what we are, but you're welcome to have a look and I'm happy to field questions over lunch. Thank you. <laughs>